Welcome to the United Label Game Showcase. We prepared fun and exciting news on Eldest Souls and Roki's Nintendo Switch version. Join us for in-depth looks at our upcoming titles. Rewind Selector. Rewind Selector. Rewind Selector. Rewind Selector. Rewind Selector. Rewind Selector. Discover the Ability Sandbox and customize your build in Eldest Souls, developed by Fallen Flag Studio. Hello everyone, and welcome to our Ability Sandbox tutorial for Elder Souls. There are three key parts that compose our Ability Sandbox system. First key part is the fighting styles. There is three of them, and they will really define how you approach each boss fight in the game. The first one is Windslide, and it's all about repositioning quickly and cutting through enemies. The second one is Berserker Slash, and it's all about building up your fury and unleashing massive consecutive blows. The third one is Counter, and it's all about careful planning and countering enemy attacks. Each style has a lot of options in its two branches, and within each branch there are multiple options to choose from. This really gives players a lot of flexibility in how they play the game. Selecting a fighting style unlocks a new bar that keeps track of the fighting style resource. In this case, I've unlocked Windslide, and a fan of leaves will unleash every time I attack, filling my Windslide bar. Once the bar is full, I can activate Windslide. The second key part is the boss shards. Defeating the deadliest bosses in the game will grant players their shards. These shards are the embodiment of their power and it will allow players to use them for their own. In this case, Corrupted Grasp allows players to quickly reposition by grappling across the map. There is going to be a large selection of different shards and each of them augments the combat style. The third key part in our ability sandbox is the infusion system. You can choose to use a shard as an active, but you can also infuse it into your base attacks and mechanics. This allows you to modify your style even further and really changes how you play. For example, a standard bloodburst attack looks like this. However, when infused with the corrupted grasp, 
Bloodburst will leave a trail of corruption on the ground, dealing damage to enemies while healing players. As players progress through the game, they will unlock more and more points to spend in fighting styles, and new shards to use and infuse with, opening a myriad of different builds. Infusing Windslide with the Lightbringer shard causes Windslide to travel much faster. The tier 1 skill Razor Lift causes my charge attacks to ignite my wind leaves, augmenting their damage. Combining those two, I can create a deadly combo, like cutting through enemies at lightning speed and then igniting my leaves. As you can guess, there is a large amount of combinations of fighting styles, skills, active shards and infusions, and creative players will be able to come up with some truly unique builds. Thank you so much for watching, we hope you'll have a good time playing through the Elder Souls demo live on Steam right now. And remember, your build, your rules. Hello everybody and welcome to the latest Elder Souls demo. You can play it right now on Steam, we'll have a quick playthrough and show you the intro of Elder Souls and what you can expect from the full game when it comes out this fall 2020 on PC and Switch. John is now in the first area. You can explore a little bit, go around, find objects and items to know more about the lore and this is all optional, you don't really have to. You can find these little items, for example the Abyssal Effigy here, you can go and read more about the lore, why you are here and what you are trying to accomplish. This is the first section of the demo, called uh, the Abandoned Battleground, I don't know if you John wanna tell us a bit more about the lore, how do you get here? Yeah we don't wanna spoil too much before the game is out but this is basically the it's an ancient site of a really big battle and you know as you go through the game you'll, you'll find out more and why the uh, battle happened here. Now it's approaching the first boss fight. This boss fight actually wasn't here at the beginning. It took a long time before we added this into the game. Just because the first um, boss fight was a little bit too harsh. So we thought that we would put something in game before to let the player experience the base mechanics. On the top left corner, you have three bars, which are the HP bar on the top, the Rage bar in the middle, and the three stamina bars. And unlike other Souls games, our stamina bar only deals with dashes, so it's only used and consumed once you dash. Well, when you attack, you can just attack freely. And the only big difference is between light attacks and charge attacks. Charge attacks are basically just a powerful attack that allows you to gain a buff, which is called Block Thirst. And uh, I don't know if you John, want to talk a little bit more about what it does. Yeah, basically it's like a very very strong buff. It kind of gives you everything. It gives you more movement speed, more attack speed, more damage and lifesteal. So in our game, bosses have really high health and you have very little. So usually trying to trade damage with them ends up in you being dead. And the fact that Blood Thirst gives you lifesteal is the only way you can actually survive in the game by constantly dealing damage and, and getting your health back. And we went to a lot of iterations before this. I mean, in the beginning there wasn't lifesteal, in the beginning there was a little bit more balance between HP of the player and HP of the bosses, but the game was a little bit too slow and we felt like the best thing to do was having this kind of like balance where even experienced player can get in a tough spot if you know that they're not careful of where they're positioned or what's happening in the fight. Yeah I think it's very cool because basically we made the game way harder but also we gave the chance of players to come back through the lifesteal mechanics so it ended up being more dynamic and more fun I think than before. And before there was actually no heal at all. I remember there was one of the things that we actually advertised when first talking about the game long time ago when prototyping it that you had no way of healing yourself up like the flasks on Dark Souls and the only way you could basically heal back was just by dying and trying again. Very similar to, I guess, I mean, Titan Soul is not that similar in the sense that that was kind of one hit damage. Uh, I think it's probably yeah. similar to Fury, if I'm not mistaken. Now you can see John is trying to get through the boss and basically in this boss fight we're just trying to teach the player the base mechanics and now it's gonna bloodburst in order to break through the boss defenses. 
And Blood Purse is basically a, a powerful attack that allows you to trade all the rage that you accumulate into a powerful attack, but then it drains all the resources that you have. In this case, you want to be careful because once you use Blood Purse, you're going to lose also the benefits of the Blood Purse buff, like movement speed, attack damage, and attack speed, and lifesteal as well. Yeah, it's definitely a trade-off because you really want the lifesteal in the game, so... It's definitely a player choice to decide if you want a Blood Burst or not. And sometimes we see a player like trading, you know, uh, for example, using Blood Burst just to finish off one, you know, to optimize the combo in one specific occasion. You can see that you can Blood Burst until the Rage Bar is uh, more than 50%. Now, John is gonna just finish off real quick the first boss and just gain a skill point. Now skill points are uh, kind of special in our game, you get them to invest into the fighting style tree and you can maybe tell us more about it. Uh... So we have three fighting styles in the game, Wind Slide, Berserk Slash and Counter. Each of them is quite different and it really defines how you're gonna fight and tackle each fight in the game. Wind Slide is all about repositioning and cutting through enemies, it's really fast and it's really about just, you know, keep being on the move and doing quick damage and kind of getting out of harm's way. Berserk Slash is about big hits. It's really cool, it's really fun. The, basically, the more you hit, the more damage you do, but at the same time, it kind of puts you in danger because you really want to keep the buff going, the Berserk buff going, so you might end up getting yourself killed by trying to, you know, keep the combo going. And finally, we have Counter, which is all about carefully positioning yourself and countering at the right time to deal massive damage. Out this, the most tactical of the, of the trees because you know it's really about you really have to think what you're doing or you might end up dead. In this case I think I'll go for Winslide because I just love the mobility. I think Winslide is also my favorite just because in most of the occasion it gives you the both offensive and defensive option. You can use it in a defensive way so you can just build up the resource and then just use it to get away from the boss but also it gets you know there is this special mechanic where you can go through bosses so it's this you know, even if you're stuck, for example, in a corner, you can just get out of it very quickly and change the change the fight completely. Yeah, I think it's very good. It's one of the situations where giving players mobility can end up in being a defensive tool or just a suicide almost. Because <laughs> if you know, if you put yourself in the right in the wrong place, you might end up dead anyway. But I think it's really good. Cool. And here you can see there is more the. I mean, what we talked about before as well, it just thinks that you can go around and explore more in Elder Souls and you can find more about the lore and information about the the characters that live into this world and the reason why you were sent here. Everything is scattered around, so it's not super clear what happened, but it's up to the player to decide if they want to find out more and how they find out more about it. And I think that's a cool part of the game is that you can really play this as a pure boss rush game. Well, you always have the choice to actually take your time and explore a bit more and find more about the world, but it's always optional. I honestly usually like just going one after the other and maybe take a little bit of time to see where I'm going and, you know, what is this big zone about. So this one is the second boss in the demo. It was the first boss uh, in the first gameplay that we ever did of the, of the game. But we found that the players were a bit struggling since there was no real introduction of the base mechanics. And now you're really... crazy to think about it that the, this was the first boss of the game, considering how hard it is. It's pretty hard, and I think it scales up from the Watchdog quite a lot since this one is not that forgiving. It hits quite hard, but also your positioning and the way you use your stamina is very important. You really don't want to waste your stamina, especially in the second phase. Yeah, he has an insane amount of damage and range. Oh, there I go, just that. So I think it's really cool to have this boss in the game just because it really teaches player how important it is to position yourself in the right place and save your stamina. Because you just won't live. Like if you you know if you waste your stamina or if you get too close to the boss in a bad, a bad time, you're just dead. Yeah, I think having just one talent pawn, it really lets you focus on the fighting styles key style, which allows you to kind of get familiar in what they do and what the activables are and how you can use them, you know, to get the maximum advantage out of them. Yeah, and I think that's a really good thing about this game is that, you know, most games have this kind of like, um, kind of easing in the players into the game, you know, and like trying to kind of like, you know, a lot of times I found myself kind of smashing through a tutorial and then like getting really stuck right after it. 
But I feel like in Elder Souls, from the get-go, you understand how hard the game is, you know, how challenging it is. So you don't really... Yes, it might kind of... It might kind of frustrate you and stop you at the beginning, but on the long run, you, it's getting, you know, the, this level of challenge from the get-go kind of helps you along. Yeah, I think it way. helps you with the kind of getting over the hill, I would say, in the sense that the, the watchdog... Some, I see some people getting stumped, some people breezing through it. It's really just like an initiation for the players. Everybody gonna get an idea of how the game is gonna be and how hard it's gonna be. And it helps you understand what are the mechanics and how to play the game, really. And the second boss, I think, is helps you a little bit understand how you can use the utilities that come with it. So, as we explained already, the you know the fighting style is gonna be a, a big feature. And also shards that you're gonna gain from uh, the, this first boss fight are also gonna help you through the other fights. Okay, my fighting style, my bar is not full, so I think I'll try to get a win for going. Yeah, you, you always want to try and probably optimize it so that you keep that bar going since um, every time you hit you're gonna get a little bit back and each of the different fighting styles can charge up the bar in different ways. That's what I really like about Winslide, I can just get right through the boss, dodge attack the way. So now the boss is in the second phase. Here you really want to try to be careful about how you use your stamina bars since he has chain combos, he can really get you in a corner and one of those combos can be quite deadly. And again I can just use wind slide to cut right through and get to safety, it's quite cool. There's some more thing you want to keep probably up your sleeve in case you feel you're threatened or maybe in a corner, get out of a bad situation. It's probably also some of the Talents, I mean, if I was a new player, that's probably what I would pick. Just because it's, it lets you do both, be defensive and be offensive. While the Berserker Slash lets you be mainly offensive and the counter is mainly defensive. I would actually pick counter right away. <laughs> it's so nice to be like, you know, to have the safety option no matter what. While in this one, you actually have to kind of like think about it, you know. Because sometimes, you know, dashing through the enemy doesn't mean you get to safety, but you might just end up in more trouble. That's true. You can also do more aggressive plays. Like gathering to the enemies with your dashes. Another thing I really like about the game is that your charge attack, you can actually direction it up to the end of it. So, which means a lot of times what I end up doing is kind of like using it actually as a semi semi dodge. I think it's quite unique. We've seen a lot of players actually saving stamina using charge attack just to dodge away. It's not the repositioning tool. Of course, you don't get the benefit of the immunity frame. So it's something you need to keep in mind. But they're definitely good to just like, you know, you can dance around the to player. Dash around. Yeah. yeah, it's pretty cool. As long as you can manage the distance, it's really important to manage your positioning in this game and not get caught by the boss because it's really, really brutal when it happens. And Johnny's gonna get first shard. You want to tell us a little bit more about these shards, what they are and what they do? It's pretty cool because shards basically kind of embody the, the power of the boss and uh, what ends up happening is that the player can use that power for their own advantage. And in the game we have this really cool system called the infusions where you can either use the shard as an active, so in this case I can, I can put it in my active slot and I can use it as a grappling hook. Which is a very good shard by the way, like it's it's one of the best moving you know, because it really allows you to be even more mobile. But on the other hand, you can also use the shard to infuse various biz actions. So I can put it here and it's gonna be used on my blood burst. Um, and it can be basically infuse any single base action you have. And on top of that you can even infuse your fighting style, which is kinda in my opinion is very cool. Um, and you know, depending on which slot you use, uh, something different happens, but um, there is going to be a lot of shards in the game, which means you can end up having a lot of different options. And on top of that, we just kill the boss so we get a skill point, and what's going to happen is we can pick a different uh, branch. There is two branches for each fighting style, and in this case I think I'm going to go with Windara, which is a really good branch. If you guys want to do the demo on Steam, I advise you to check it out. And yeah. I think Windara is very good for like AoE damage, something that is up there you don't really need to be too mindful about. Until you can, you know, pop on and then, you know, it just keeps going. Here, there is a quick tutorial, so you just need to get across the bridge. It teaches a little bit the base mechanics. John just put the shard in the active slot, 
and he used it to grapple uh, across the bridge and get to the next phase and now he's going to fuse into the blood burst which gives him an extra effect when blood bursting and this is gonna leave an effect on the floor which basically does damage over time and also heals him a little bit and again the game is basically about trying those combination and finding your best play style you can really choose how you want to fight and what you want to do the second part of the demo towards the end of the crossroads and this section again the whole game is gonna be not empty but desolated I would say I don't want to spoil the reason why but there is a good reason for it I don't know if you John want to give something away probably not but yeah definitely the world is kind of empty dark and like, mysterious and that's kind of like by design but the cool thing is I think um, with the players who want to there is a lot of hints around the world you know to kind of figure out why and what happened and at the same time um, if you don't want to and you just want to fight <laughs> usually the boss fights routes are quite direct so in this case for me to walk to the next boss it's gonna take me just a few seconds we also have a contest going on now so if you want to try and win yourself a key of the full game you can go on our steam community and check it out it's a speedrun contest and you can either compete in the story mode where you have to finish the game as fast as possible or in the abyss mode where you have to fight even stronger enemies Check it out on our Steam page and wish you luck. Thanks a lot. Bye. Explore the wilderness and the Scandinavian folklore on Nintendo Switch with Roki. Developed by Polygon Treehouse. They said they were just stories. <laughs> they said there was nothing out here. They said the old magic was dead. <laughs> they said there was no such thing as monsters. Hello and welcome to this playthrough video of Rurki. I'm Alex, I'm one of the co-directors of the game. We're actually going to play through a new area of the game we haven't shown much of before, the third, the third act. So, well the best way to explain what the game is about is to is just jump straight in. So we will do that now. So here you see we've arrived at a castle at the centre of the lake. And actually, I was saying you're playing as two in the game, but the third act changes uh -huh. things up. So as you can see, actually, now we're controlling someone Tor called Henry, who's actually Tuve's father. And one of the first things that people tend to notice about the Gosh. game is fully 3D. It has this quite clean graphical art style. So that's sometimes when people see screenshots, they, mm -hmm. they think it might be uh, be 3D, but it's it's actually all completely uh, uh, 2D. But it actually, it's all, all 3D, which is quite neat. Um, so here you can see we have complete freedom to run around. and. Uh, which is quite cool and it's actually just really nice to make paths in the snow. Also if you want to go a little bit faster we have a sprint button so you can sprint around as a character and choose to explore as you wish. And we very much want our Rookie to be an accessible modern adventure game so one of the things we have is if you click the left stick in you can see the various things that you can interact with which is quite which is quite cool. And then yeah, this is Henrik's backpack where he'll keep his items. Hmm. But first of all we saw this it was flashing so let's go have a look at that 
it's all the interactions of, of proximity motion. If you want to interact with something, you just walk, walk next to it and you can look. But for now, let's, um, let's go and see what's happening up here. So, at the start of the first act of the game, Henry was kind of put out of action. I'll talk about that too much because it's spoilers. But, um, uh, so here you can see he's, he's, he's been trying to find his kids. He's arrived at this castle and there's a, a ghostly presence there. Two veyers in her own mission has, has crossed over into Uthengard, this nether realm, uh, to try and find her brother. So let's have a look. Ooh. Whoa. So they have a, a father, the bond of father and daughter, so even though they're separated by by reality and realms, uh, they can still kind of uh, sense each other. So the third act involves the gameplay of, of Ruki by having this, uh, having you be able to swap at will between Henrik and Tuve, and therefore swapping between Innergard and Utengard, uh, the netherworld and the, and the real world. So it's quite a cool uh, development uh -huh. in the game. So here you can see any time we can, we can press the triggers and oh. then we'll uh, we'll swap from one character to the next. Um, and at this point they, they, they're, they're kind of aware of a presence but they're not really sure what's happened. There's been lots of strange and weird things happening oh. in the game. Um, so there's one of the nice things we try and do in the game is tell the story via the, the gameplay. And so here we're sort of about exploring and, and, and fixing the bond between father and daughter and bringing them close together through this through getting to Lars, through getting to the tower at the centre of this great castle. Um, so yeah, there's a journal in the game. So here you can see, uh, Henrik can see the, the journal where he can uh, he can examine, you know, he can, he can look about the notes that Tuve has made. Um, yes, the, the journal is where Tuve will scribble down maps and she'll collect badges. Uh, and it's how we, we help guide the player through the game because some of the, the areas can be quite big and expansive with lots of different locations and creatures so it's a nice way for Ooh. us to get a, a more of an insight into Tuve's story but also um, to help you know, help guide you if you're stuck with a puzzle you can go and look in the journal to see if there are any notes there that hmm. might help um, so Henrik's starting to get an idea that you know, Tuve may have got here but he thinks, he, he thinks he's just found this journal in, in his bag but actually it's because they're, they, they're linked and they're bond um, so yeah, let's have a look round. So yeah, as we said, you can now swap at will between the various characters, and actually, uh, we've actually unlocked a badge in the journal. So let's look. So we have these wilderness scout badges, and as you can see, through for finishing the second act, uh, Tuve has now uh, has now got a wilderness scout badge. So the, the journal is a really cool way where we store all, all these things. Uh, but yeah, let's have a look round. So. I'm guessing first of all, it's just you know to emphasise there's a, a real difference between uh, Utengard, the outer nether nether reality, and the the real world um, where where Henrik is. So there's a, you know, similarities there, but at some point these two worlds got got separated. As you see, Henrik's Henrik's uh, world is much is much warmer than two and also obviously they're they're very different. Uh, they're different people. She's you know, small and, and spry, and he's um, He's, he's chunkier, so there's there's different things that they can they can do. Um, so for example, there's a yeah you know, something that Tuve can't quite get because the world is 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 frozen over, and we explore more. There's, you know maybe there's a way that she can get in here, um, but she can't quite squeeze through. Um, but yeah, you get an idea of the of the 3D exploration that we have in the game. And this acts about getting getting you know, closer into the, um, getting deeper and deeper into the into the castle. But it's quite a fun way to to play, and as you can see, you know, it's quite neat to be able to mm -hmm. to explore um, in in three D uh, uh -huh. using the, the two characters to swap across worlds. Mm. Um, and we we try and tell the story of Rookie by by gameplay we want the player wow. to experience it through gameplay rather than having too many uh, wow. too many cutscenes so here you can see Henrik's discovered an explorer's crate so there's been a past expedition to this island and you know the fact that Lars mm. has been taken by the monster throughout the game you get the impression mm. that this may have happened uh, before and maybe something that's a reoccurring mm. incident um, that's a nice way of, of of you know being able to to learn about the story, 
through exploration, through exploring and finding new things, which is how we like to tell the story. So you see he's picked up um, you know, a new item, which then goes into its backpacks. So when you have a new item and you want to try and use it, you can hold down and, and drag it on something in the world, uh, or you can, you, know, you can tap the examine button and, uh, and you know, Henry will examine it and tell you a bit more information about it. You see, if we if we switch to Tubo now as well, um, you know the items are shared. So items you pick up as Tubo, Henry will be able to access, and vice versa. So here's you know she can't she can't quite remember picking it up. Um, but yeah, we need to be able to get through. But there's that frozen item there. So let's have a go with with Henry. Um, yeah, we need to get deep into the castle, but it's a big old gate. Which I don't think we're going to be able to get through. So let's try um, to start off with. See if we can get. See if we can get too late through. So Henrik's a bit bit beefier. Um, so you can see he can actually open up. So maybe he can fit through here now. Now that he's still he's still too big. But we handily know someone who isn't. And so you can see now um, with Tuve, we we're able to come around here. And Henrik essentially is has opened up a, a path for Tuve deeper into the castle. Um, so now we're in what appears to be um, a gatehouse and we have a there's a path back to the beach here and two huh. mysterious uh, item slots. So I wonder if we can find something to put in there. We don't have anything yet. Pressure pad here, and a, uh, but then oh, the, the lever gets disappeared. So there's an another path here deeper in, and we're always trying to reach this central tower surrounded by ravens in this act. So we can't get in there yet. I suspect that lever may help us. Um, and again, the ladder is too frozen there for Tube to uh, to climb. So it looks like we're going to need to find a way of getting Henrik inside to help us out. Uh, but you know, Tuve is more agile than Henrik, so she can um, a bit more fearless, and she can she can climb and, and, and reach new areas. So yeah, that's that's the one of the counterweights. But let's see if we can if we can find something outside to help us. Hmm. Uh, so here, there's a couple of new items. There's a a big old rock, and it looks like these is one of the the gate medallions we might be able to use to get deeper into the castle. And here you can see again. You can you, know, you can swap swap worlds any time. So here you can see we're back as as Henrik, and uh, you'll always be able to see the the ghostly reflection of, of Tuve in the other realm. So let's see if we can't uh, if we can't if we can't get Henrik inside to help us get further on our adventure. <laughs> And one of the nice things about the game being in 3D is it remains nice and, and crisp all the time. Um, it also allows us to be very dynamic with the, the cameras, how you know, we couldn't really do that in a, in a 2D game. So let's see. Now we have um, an item we've picked up. So you can see that's how you use items in the game. You just drag and drop them onto things. We've made all the interaction points quite sticky, so it feels quite tactile to use on, on, on the pad and the controllers. Uh, but we're still missing one. There was one outside, but too big couldn't get it because it was. It's too frozen, but luckily we know a chap who can help. Um, so there, Henrik has access to some items. Uh, and because Henrik has picked up the item outside, actually that means that the Tube has now mm -hmm. got access to the item, which is pretty neat. Um, although she, at this point, is still they're still not really aware of each other's presence. There's something strange going on, but they can't quite put their finger on it. But now that allows us to to use the second uh, gate medallion yes. to help open the outer gate and get Henry inside to, to assist us on our adventure. Yes, yeah, so he still thinks something a little bit curious is going on or this place might, might be haunted. He doesn't, he doesn't really know, um, know what's happening, but let's see if we can get a little bit deeper in. Um, so... Here we have, uh, yeah, we're inside. So, so I think let's try first of all and see if we can, uh, if we can make this work. So now Henrik's done the pressure pad. I should be able to pull the lever and maybe open this gate. Let's see. Oh, 
one of the counterweights is a little bit broken, but actually as, as Henrik we can probably get at this ladder that was frozen up for Tuvo um, and see if anything is wrong up here. Ah, so this one's got something missing and actually Tuvo picked up a rock. Uh, even though Henrik doesn't quite remember, it's one of those the shared items again, so we're going to use that to try and balance out the counterweights and then let's go and try the Try the puzzle again and see how we get on. Uh, so again, let's get Henrik on here. And try our luck again. Huh? And voila! So there you get an idea of some of the, the back and forth gameplay. It's all item interactions and, and puzzles. You have to use a, your brain work it's a non-violent game. But here you get an idea of how the third act changes mm. things up and there's lots of, of back and forth gameplay and father and daughter have been quite estranged, forced to, to cooperate with each other and, and reforge their, their bond. And you can see there two ways starting to realize that, her, that, that you know, she can smell pickled herrings, which is her father's favorite snack. Um, and so she's starting to get an idea and here you can see wow we've come into this new location this is actually almost like a hub for the third act a really big um a really big location um and you can see now we've come into a new area we've got a new a new journal entry and which too actually makes a little sketch and you know she'll make a, some notes about about the various different areas that she's discovering so the journal is a really cool um, area to keep track of your adventures um, but yeah, we'll have a brief look round because we don't want to spoil too much about the game. You can see there's these uh, creepy raven creatures who are who are in these these gibbets who uh, who react to you as you're going along. There's lots of lost locked gates um, to unlock and many different areas to explore. Uh, but this is a, a, a cool location um, in Act Three. And, and a real, real hub of your adventure. But first of all, let's get Henry back in to join us before we get, before we can carry on our adventure. Very well. So again, something's happened that he doesn't quite understand. It looks like um, it looks like someone's helping him get closer into the into the centre of the castle. But he doesn't, he doesn't really understand it. Um, as the act goes on, maybe they'll they'll start to realise each other are there and they're, they're helping each other as they go. And we'll leave it there. Hopefully that's given you an insight into Rurki, our modern take on update in the classic adventure game. And uh, you know, some insight into how it plays and how it works and the level of exploration and the type of puzzles there are in the game. And that's a wrap. We look forward to welcoming you to the Scandinavian wilderness very soon. Goodbye. That concludes the first ever United Label Game Showcase. We're looking forward to showing you more about our upcoming games. We hope that you've enjoyed this presentation, and thank you for watching.